Now, there are not a lot of exciting passages in the book of Exodus, except for plagues on Egypt and the Red Sea. Uh, but uh, here is a passage that's quite interesting and exciting. Exodus chapter 17, beginning with verse 8. It says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Well, from this passage of Scripture, there are a few things we can learn. We can learn a few things about our enemy. We can learn some things about prayer. We can learn some things about the battle. So consider this passage with me if you would. Number one, notice there was an enemy. It says in verse 8, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Now Israel, you keep in mind, was just beginning they were just on their way out of Egypt. They just crossed the Red Sea. And they were just getting going. The uh, Lord had begun to send them manna so they would have food to eat. Uh, the Lord had sent them water out of the rock. But they haven't even gotten to Mount Sinai yet. They've only been on the road two or three weeks. And here they are attacked by these people called the Amalekites. Now, uh, history doesn't tell us much about the Amalekites. We know they were a strong group in that area, and that's about all we know about them. But they attacked Israel. Now, Israel had done nothing to bother them. Israel had not attacked them. They would not given them a hard time. They would not taken over their land. Maybe the Amalekites thought they might. Uh, maybe they thought they would get rich if they would attack Israel. After all, the reports were that Israel had left Egypt with a lot of gold and a lot of valuable things. Uh, so maybe they could enrich themselves by attacking uh, Israel. We are not sure what their methods were. But whatever uh, their motives were, whatever, they attacked. Israel was not expecting it. Israel was not prepared for it. They were not anticipating an attack out there in the middle of the wilderness, but all of a sudden, there was this enemy attacking them. They had an enemy. Now, I hope you realize that we have an enemy. You have an enemy. And our enemy is not the politicians. Your enemy is not your relatives, though you may think they are sometimes. Uh, your, neighbor, your enemy is not your nasty neighbor or big government or the people you work with, or the liberals, or whatever. Our enemy is the devil, the old dragon called Satan. That one who was God's highest angel of all the wonderful angels God had created. Uh, Satan was the highest one, the shining one, and he is the one who led a rebellion against God and fell into sin. And Peter tells us that he walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's you or me that he would seek to devour. He is our enemy. He's out to attack you and destroy you and drag you down to an eternal hell if he could. And if you are born again, he's still after you. And he will destroy you. He will ruin you. He will drag you into sin. He will destroy your home. He will use anything. He will use drugs or materialism, or busyness, or alcohol, or dishonesty, or bad habits, or immorality, or, or anything else he can think of. Use it to ruin your life, uh, to weaken your home, uh, to destroy the things that are good in your life. He will lead you to wrong decisions. Uh, he will make bad things look good and good things look bad. 
anything to destroy you. And he has not only the devil, it's not only him, but the devil has uncountless thousands of helpers, those angels who fell with him, thousands upon thousands of demons, and all together they are out to get God's people and other people as well, to drag them down. And I hope you recognize that he is your enemy. Now, he is more strong than you are. He's more wise than any of us are. And so he's a frightful enemy to deal with. But we have an enemy. And our enemy is the devil himself and those who follow him. Now, the next thing I notice is that these, when these Amalekites attacked Israel, they attacked the weakest part of the nation. Now, keep your finger there in Exodus, but go over to another account of this in the book of Numbers, chapter 25. Numbers, chapter 25. Verse 17. After those 40 years in the wilderness, Moses is kind of reviewing their history for Israel so they could learn and remember some things from it. And he says this, Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17, he says, Remember what Amalek did unto thee, by the way, when ye were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee there by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. Here was an enemy who had no concern for what was right or wrong, no concern for God, and he smote, it says, the weakest of them. Now, at that time, Israel was kind of scattered around, and they were just all moving as kind of a mob uh, down the road generally in the direction of Mount Sinai, and of course, the oldest and the weakest, those with little children, those with old folk, uh, since mostly they were walking along, uh, they were way back at the end of the line. And uh, that's where Amalek attacked. He attacked at their weakest point. Now later on, you realize, uh, after Mount Sinai, uh, God organized Israel. They were all in groups, and the strongest group was in front, and another strongest group was in back, and they had a certain order for march and all that. Uh, but at the beginning, they were just kind of a motley mob, just kind of straggling along, heading more or less in the same direction without any organization whatsoever. And so it was a good military strategy uh, for Amalek to attack the weakest part of the group, and they did. They attacked back there at the back where the weak folk was, less protection, and uh, weaker people, older people, and so on. And Israel was a sitting duck. Uh, they were kind of scattered around, you know, they weren't uh, two columns marching in a row at this point. Uh, they had no defense. They had no watchmen to warn them danger was coming. They had no soldiers prepared to fight. They had no communication. I'm not sure even how many weapons they had, probably not many. And so it was a good time for, uh, for Amalek to attack. They weren't ready, they weren't expecting it, they were weak, and they could attack. And they did. That's always the def devil's method. Attack when you're the weakest. Remember when the devil came to tempt Jesus? It was after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights without food and water. And it says after that he was weak, he was hungry, he was tired. And that's when the devil came to tempt him, when he was at his weakest. When does the devil attack you? Same time, when you're weak, when you're perhaps sick or discouraged, when you haven't read your Bible lately, when you've been skipping church or prayer meeting and all, and you get spiritually weak, and then he will attack to tempt you, to make you bitter, to discourage you, uh, to beat you down in one way or another. The devil attacks when you're weak. Now, the third thing I want us to notice from this passage in Exodus is that the battle was in the invisible world. The battle was in the invisible world. The enemy wasn't really the Amalekites. Their enemy was the devil. And they couldn't see the devil, but he was there. Uh, he was giving those Amalekites ideas. He was putting that thought in their heart. 
He was stirring them along. He was helping in the battle. But we always think the battle is with things we can see. You know, the situations around us, the people we know, the people we deal with, things we can see. But that's not so. The real battle is the invisible war. The real battle is with the enemy we cannot see. Now notice in Exodus verse 9 and 10. Again it says, Moses spake unto Aaron, say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel. Wait a minute, I've got the wrong chapter here. I think. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, chapter 17, verse 9 and 10. Moses said unto Joshua, choose us out men. And go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and her went up to the top of the hill. Moses said, Joshua, you get men. See what swords you can get together. Try and organize them. And you go down and fight with the Amalekites. Attack them. You go down there in the valley and fight. And I will go up to the top of the hill and fight. And Joshua was going to fight with the Amalekites. And Moses was going to fight with the devil. You see, the devil knew what was going to happen if Israel went on. He knew that they would receive the laws of God. He knew that later on that nation of Israel would give to us the Bible. He knew that later on the nation of Israel would give us Jesus Christ, the Savior, to die on the cross for our sins and pay for our, the penalty so we could be delivered from hell. And he didn't want any of those things to happen. And so he said, I need to stop them now. Destroy them now. And so the devil, they saw the Amalekites, but the devil was the real power behind the scenes. And so Joshua took the soldiers and went down into the valley and joined the battle. And Moses went up to the top of the hill where he could see the battle, see the enemy and the soldiers. And there he lifted up his hands in prayer. Now, you can pray in any kind of posture. You know, you can pray standing up. You can pray sitting down. You can pray on your knees. You can pray lying down. Uh, you can pray with your hands folded. You can pray with your hands up or whatever. It doesn't matter that much to God uh, as long as we're praying. Uh, but uh, Josh, uh, Moses wanted to lift up his hands to God in prayer. And so he held his rod and lifted it up in prayer. And down there the soldiers could all look up on the hill and they could see Moses standing there with his rod and know that he was praying for them. Moses held up his hands and when he held up his hands uh, the Israelite army was able to push forward and the enemy was being defeated but his arms got tired. You know, you can't stand holding your hands up like that for very long. And he got tired and he let his hands down and then the Amalekites started to press the battle forward. And they were winning and Israel was losing. He held up his hands and kept praying again. And you know the soldiers could have looked at Moses up there and said, Moses, what are you standing up there for? Why don't you get a sword and come down here and help us, help us fight the battle? But they were fighting the visible battle. And Moses was fighting the real battle. You see, the battle on the battlefield was won because the battle on the hill was won. He couldn't hold his hands up all the time, so they sat him down on a big rock, and then Aaron stood on one side and held up this rod, and her stood on the other side and hold, held up that hand. And so he could keep his hands up and keep on praying, and they could see that he was praying. And the battle was won there on the hill. You see, the Israelites were fighting the Amalekites. And Moses was fighting the devil. Israel was fighting the visible enemy. And Moses was fighting the invisible enemy. Israel was fighting with the sword. And Moses was fighting with prayer. And so the battle went on and Israel won. Now turn to your New Testament with me. And notice the background of what I'm saying in the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. The Apostle Paul writes to us 
and says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We're not fighting with people, with things we can see, people we can understand. We're fighting with the invisible hosts of Satan, principalities, his powers, his demons, his agents that we can't see. We're fighting with them. That's where the real battle is, you see. Our wrestling, our striving, our spiritual progress does not depend on material means. Paul says in one place, we, the weapons of our warfare, 2 Corinthians 10, are not carnal, but mighty through God. They're spiritual weapons. We fight with prayer. Uh, go back to Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter 10. Let me show you an example of this. Daniel, chapter 10, Old Testament, book of Daniel, 10th chapter. Daniel chapter 10, verses 2 and 3. Daniel has been receiving inspired revelations from God, visions of the future and all these things. And there were some things he didn't understand. He wanted to understand. In verse 2, Daniel 10, verse 2, it says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks, 21 days. He says, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, living on a few bread crusts and water. Verse 3, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were finished. You see, God was about to reveal Daniel, visions of the future, a great prophecies concerning what would happen in the future and uh, visions that would help the people of God to understand God's program and what was going on. So Daniel was praying about that. He wanted to understand those things. And then he saw a vision of the angel as he was praying after three weeks. Verse 5 says, Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man uh, clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with the gold of Euphaz. A mighty man in this vision, an angel of God. Verse 11, and he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Daniel, you've been praying. And when you started praying, I was ready to come and give you these revelations from God. Verse 13, but, he says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remain there with the king of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in thy latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Get the picture. Here God is sending this angel to give these revelations to Daniel as Daniel begins to pray that God would give him understanding of these things. And the angel is sent, but he is stopped, he's hindered by what he refers to as the prince of Persia, not a prince in the human sense, but the angelic being, that demon spirit who was in charge of the affairs of Persia, and he stopped this angel of God. And he hindered him for three weeks until finally through the prayers of Daniel uh, he overcame and went on to bring Daniel these revelations. You see, through his pr prayer the battle was won. And through the prayer that angel was able to overcome and deliver this message to Daniel. So let us understand that the real battle is not in the visible arena, but the real battle is in the invisible. 
It's kind of like watching a football game on television. So we might do that sometime, I don't know. But uh, you watch a football game on television. There you sit in your living room and you look at all these little guys running back and forth on the screen in front of you. They're not there. Maybe you didn't know that, but they're not there. Nothing's happening there. That's just a vision, a picture of what's happening a thousand miles away in some football stadium somewhere. That's where the real, the real battle is not. You know, they're fighting back and forth, throwing each other around, jumping on top of each other and all that sort of thing. But that's not the real battle. The real battle is a thousand miles away in the stadium there. This battle is just the one that you see there on your television. And that's the way it is in this spiritual battle. Uh, we see things happening, these things happening, these circumstances, these difficulties occurring and all. That's what we see. That's not the real battle. The real battle is what's going on in the spiritual world where uh, the forces of God are contending with the forces of evil and the devil is out there to try and de uh, deceive us and defeat us any way that he can. That's where the real battle lies. And a lot of things that happen, the things you see, uh, they're not the real battle, but the things you don't see behind the scenes in the invisible realm, that's where the real battle is. And that's the way it is in the warfare of God's people. The real battle is not what you see. You just see the reflections of it. The real battle is the invisible world of God's forces and the demons. Remember that Old Testament prophet in the city, little city of Dothan, and he had been telling the king of Israel where the Syrian armies would attack him and where they'd hide out for him to ambush him. He'd been passing that information along and the Syrian king says, who's telling on us anyway? Who's betraying our plans? And one of them said, it's not any of us. It's that prophet in Israel. He's telling the king what you say. And so he sent his army to surround that little city of Dothan. And the prophet woke up in the morning and sent his his servant out to see how the day was, and the servant came back all shaking. He said, oh, uh, master, we're undone. We're surrounded by the, by the Syrian army. They've come to capture you and destroy us. What are we going to do? And the prophet says, no worry. The prophet said, Lord, open his eyes. And suddenly he opened his eyes so that he could see into the spiritual realm. And the mountains and hills all around were filled with the armies of the Lord, the horsemen and the chariots of Almighty God. And the battle was won that day. And the prophet wasn't taken prisoner at all. But you see, that's the way it is. Uh, go back to Ephesians chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 11, Paul says, Take, put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand. Be equipped. And he tells you about the armor you need for your equipment, the helmet of salvation, your feet shod with the gospel of peace, and the uh, breastplate of righteousness, and uh, your loins girt about with truth, and all the rest of the army, armor. And then he says, verse 18, Praying always. Stand, get the armor, be equipped. And pray always with all and prayer, all prayer and supplication in the spirit. You see, the real battle is the spiritual battle. You take the spiritual armor, you take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, you stand your ground and you pray, and that's how the battle is won. The battle is won by prayer. The enemy is defeated by prayer, and sinners are converted by prayer, and victory is won by prayer. See, prayer is the nerve that moves the mighty arm of God. Prayer is the force that unleashes the power of God. Remember that distraught father who met Jesus when Jesus and three of his disciples were coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration? And that father came all distraught and said, Oh, Master, do something for my son. He's possessed of a demon. He's always trying to destroy himself. And, and I brought him to my, your disciples. They couldn't do anything for him. And Jesus healed that boy. And then his disciples said, How come we couldn't do with that? And Jesus said, This kind, that particular powerful kind of demon, this kind cometh not out but by prayer. 
Go with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Verse 40. Luke twenty two forty. 40. When he, that is Jesus, was at the place, the Garden of Gethsemane, he said unto them, his disciples, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. Pray. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down upon the ground. And when he rose up from his prayer, he rose up to face the cross. You see, Jesus was involved, engaged in a spiritual struggle. In his human frame, uh, he was weak. He didn't uh, have any desire to face the cross and the suffering. And he had to fight the battle. But the victory was not in the material realm, but in the spiritual. Uh, God sent an angel to strengthen him. Didn't get a granola bar or a pep pill to do it. He got help from God as he prayed. And because he prayed... There was that strength from the angel in the invisible world. Go to the book of Acts chapter 12. Acts 12th chapter. Verse 3. And because he, that is Herod, that wicked, despicable king, saw it pleased the Jews, that is, he'd had James put to death, and that made the Jews happy. That was politically expedient. And so he proceeded further to take Peter also. Verse 5. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. He arrested Peter. Had to wait till the Passover was over because that wouldn't be a good time to do something like that. But as soon as the Passover was over, he'd take Peter out and have him killed. And there was Peter in that jail. Feet chained to stocks, his arms chained to a soldier on each side, the doors of the prison locked, the inner prison and the outer prison. There he was locked, awaiting his execution. But notice what it says in the last part of that verse. Verse 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. People were praying. The church was praying. They were praying without ceasing. They were praying day and night for several days. They prayed and they prayed and they prayed more. And you know the story. They prayed and God sent an angel. An angel came into that prison, filled it with light. The chains fell off Peter's arms and feet. The doors of the prison opened and Peter walked out a free man, victorious, victorious, because victory was won through the spiritual world of prayer. Prayer gave the victory. Go back to Second Chronicles chapter 13. Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 13. Second Chronicles chapter 13, the kingdom of Israel was divided into two halves, warring each other, Judah and Israel. And Judah was attacked by Israel. And Judah was surrounded, and they were outnumbered, and there didn't look like there was any hope for them at all. They were going to be wiped out. But notice chapter 13, verse 14. It says, when Judah looked back, behold, the battle was before and behind. I mean, they were surrounded, enemies behind them, enemies in front of them, and they cried unto the Lord. Their first attempt wasn't to fight the enemy. Their first attempt was to pray. They cried unto the Lord, and the priests sounded with the trumpets. Then the men of Judah gave a shout, and as the men of Judah shouted, it came to pass that God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. And the children of Israel fled before Judah, and God delivered them into their hand. And 
uh, Abijah and his people slew them with a great slaughter, so there fell down slain of Israel 500,000 chosen men. Thus the children of Israel were brought under at that time, and the children of Judah prevailed because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. They depended on God. They cried to God, and God gave them the victory. They were in a hopeless situation, but they prayed and called on the Lord, and the Lord gave them victory. Go on to the book of Revelation, the fifth chapter. Revelation chapter 5. Now watch this carefully. Here we have a scene in the future during the days of tribulation. When the people who trust in God are persecuted and killed, the word of God is despised, false religion rules the world. And the only hope for the people of God is that God would send, God would send judgment upon the unbelievers. Now notice chapter 5. I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereon. Now notice, here's this great scene in heaven. God sits on the throne holding this book with seven seals, and each of those seals represent a judgment that's going to come upon this world, a judgment that will give, in a sense, a little breathing space to those who are followers of the Lord. But nobody's able to open the book. And he says, oh, the Lamb of God will open the book. Now notice verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the Lamb, Jesus Christ, comes and takes the book. When he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. They fall down to worship God, these, tw these uh, 24 elders, and they have to pour out before the throne of God sweet odors, which are the prayers of God's people. Now notice chapter 6, go on in the account here. Chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and so on. And each seal represented a judgment that came. When did the judgment come? They were waiting until the prayers of the saints were poured out before God. And then the seals of judgment upon the godly, ungodly were poured out. Now you have the same picture in Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. When he had opened the seventh seal, that is the seventh seal of judgment, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Each of those trumpets represents another judgment that's going to come upon God. And all heaven is silent, and they watch as these trumpets are passed out to seven angels. And then they're standing and waiting. Verse 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. He offered this prayers of the saints before the throne of God. Verse 4, And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hands. Verse 6, and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And the judgments came. The program of God went forward because of the prayers of God's people. Their prayers ascended on the altar before God. 
and the trumpet sounded, and the judgment came. You see, the battle was not won by material means. The battle for those saints in those days of tribulation is not won by protests or rallies or riots or bombings, but God's people prayed and God sent the judgment. You see, the battle is not one we see. The battle is one we don't see. The battle is not won by physical means. The battle is won by prayer. And for God's people, victories are not gained by soldiers on the march. Victories are gained by God's people on their knees. Spiritual victories are gained by prayer. And when we pray, the arm of God, who's mighty, gives us the victory in Christ Jesus. And that's what God's people need to understand. Remember when David challenged Goliath? That little teenager stood there before that giant of man and said, the battle is the Lord's. And the battle was won because he depended on God. The prophet Zechariah says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And in the Psalms, David prayed, Lord, you rise up and take hold of shield and buckler. In other words, Lord, you rise up and fight the battle for us. The Apostle Paul understood that. I see what he says in the book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 30, where he says this. Romans, chapter 15, verse 30. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. He says, I need help, I'm weak, uh, I want you to strive together with me in prayer. There are things that need to be done, and the devil resi will resist all our efforts. Paul said, pray for me, I have to do the job, but I can only do that as you strive in prayers and God gives the victory. The same is true in your life. Your real enemy is the devil. And all the demons of hell, he's out to defeat you and destroy you. And the only way to overcome is through faith and prayer. Shall we bow in prayer? Heads bowed, let me just...